All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to Good Afternoon Ghana. My name is Aldo Moro, and this afternoon we're going to be looking at a very important subject matter. We're looking at the relevance of the Constitution Day, which has now been made a statutory public holiday. We observed it on Monday. But the question still arises as to whether we ought to have made it a statutory public holiday, whether we couldn't have done it without a holiday, is still out there in terms of the debate. This morning I'll be joined by the chairperson for the National Commission for Civic Education, uh, who will be telling us more about the relevance of this day and also some of the issues that have come up about our constitution, whether it is still fit for purpose. Stay tuned in. My name is Awudu Moro. All right, welcome back. This is, this is Good Afternoon, Ghana. As I did indicate at the beginning of the show, this afternoon we have a very, very important conversation to have. It's got to do with the supreme law of this land. It's the Ghana's constitution. 28th April 1992 was when it was promulgated. 7th January, uh, 7th January 1993 when it was actually when it kicked into force. But it's now been made... The observ observance of that day has now been made a statutory public holiday since the assumption of office of His Excellency President Nana Adudankwa E. Kufuad. He says, observe it, remind ourselves that we have a constitution. And also, two, let's look at the strikes that we've made 30 years since we've had this constitutional democratic dispensation. But well, who else is here to tell us more about, um, or who can tell us more about the relevance of, day, of this day is the... Chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, that's Madam Kathleen Adi, who's uh, joining us in a, few, in a matter of minutes, to tell us more about the relevance of this day and to tell us why you and I have to observe it and, and obstacle observe it and give it all the importance and the relevance that um, it deserves as of when um, it comes up. Ghana is 30 years since it went constitutional as far back as in 1993, 7th January. So at this juncture, let me just welcome Madam Kathleen Adi, and, um, and so we can proceed with our conversation uh, for today. Madam, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. It's Thank always so a pleasure much. having you on Good, good Afternoon Ghana. In fact, on Metro TV, uh, for some reason, the NCC and Metro TV seem to have a very good relationship. Perhaps Extremely we should partner a bit more. Um, <laughs> Extremely great relationship. Yeah, we, yeah. we always um, name Metro as one of the... Yeah. media houses Key that allies. understands right. their, their civic responsibility and so okay. are very um, generous with airtime right. and every time there's an, anything at all they give us the opportunity. We are grateful right. again. Right, right. Now, you know, before we get to the specifics in terms of why we're here to talk about the Constitution Day, I've had a lot of people say, well, the NCCE tends to be too quiet on other matters. Um, and then, so basically, you, the NCC picks and chooses what it wants to talk about. So you look at the Constitution Day. Um, you've been quite vocal. You've been quite vociferous about this day because of the, the sort of relevance that you attach to it. First of all, how do you, how do you take that kind of public criticisms that mm -hmm. you've not been talking enough? Do you think it's a fair one? Or you think that perhaps some people are yet to really have a full grasp of the understanding or appreciation of what the NCC is supposed to do? Thank you very much. NCC does have a big mandate. Right. And there, there may be an element of truth in that, but not lately. Right. Lately, we've done a lot better, and right. I think that people should acknowledge that. Even on this platform, in the last year, we're here about three, four times. And right. people, sometimes people think that NCC means that I have to show up. Yeah, This is a big institution right. with over 1,700 staff. Right. We have offices in every region, offices in every district, and they are working. And their work is not, um, it's not a, a big screen work like we're doing here in the capital. Their work is in the marketplaces, on the lorry parks with their horns. Their work is in churches and mosques in the districts. Their work is working with uh, uh, in, engaging uh, trade associations and all of that. And so sometimes people feel that, and, and it's because we see, we framed leadership as some kind of, a one-man show kind no, of thing. No, it's not. Yeah. It's certainly not, uh, right. you know, in the NCC because right. it's a big institution. It's a highly decentralized institution. And people do a lot of work. I always encourage people to go on our social media pages. We, we show across the country the different engagements that we are having. And none of them have me in it. Okay. 
you I know, see. That's interesting. yes, none of them have meaning because yeah. I can't be here and be in Dambai at the yeah, same time. But that's time. a mark of good leadership. Yes, I'm, I can't yeah. be here and be Dambai at the same time. Right. Of course, I do go around, but my main job is not to go and do the work of my staff in the district. Right. So when that that criticism is made, it's a bit unfair, especially to the staff, because working in the NCC is sacrificial work. It's the work and the really tough circumstances. They have they don't have the full set of things that they need to work. Yet they go out there and do it. People walk. They walk school to school to engage our civic clubs. They walk, they go from village to village, farm to farm. So it's slightly unfair right. to say that they don't they don't work. That's that, not true. That is not to say that um, if if you had sufficient resources and sufficient oh, of course. You know, um, I mean, backing from the system. That, 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 goes, with, that, goes, that goes without saying. Absolutely. What I say is that we do the very best with what we have. Under the circumstances. If we had more, we would do better. Yeah. But given what we have, we really do. So tell me, yeah. how do you, for instance, gauge feedback? How, do you, how are you able to, for instance, tell yeah. if the public sensitization, the public education you've been engaging in mm. is actually yielding or bearing the fruits? Bearing fruits. You know, okay, so how, how do you gauge? So, so before we, we do um, basic standardized monitoring evaluation, before every program, we, you know, we, we gauge at the end of a program, we have a form that people fill to say what they've learned and all of that. Um, given the kind of work that we do, we should, have, we should be able to undertake bigger research, social, social science research, be able to gauge the things that we do. But that costs quite a bit of money. Right. So it's not something we've done on a large scale, mm -hmm. but on a programmatic scale, we always you know, try and assess based on the feedback that we get, program, program specific, you know, program on program, the feedback that we get, we try and assess that to see how people are taking it. We take the criticism, uh, we take the suggestions, and then we, we, we build it in. When we have a project that is funded, such as the current project that we're running um, in, the, in the five northern, within eight regions out of the 16, on preventing and containing violent extremism, right. which was launched last year, right? Okay. For that project, because it's fully funded and provisioning is made for, we started off the project with a baseline study where we went into the communities to have a clear understanding of what people know, people's understanding of the issues, what will really work for them in terms of how to even structure um, interventions and what people should do and all of that. And at the end of the project, we will have an end, end line study. So we can tell from that that this is how we've moved forward in terms of how people have understood the work that we've done or the impact of what we've done to an extent, right? Mm -hmm. But like I said, it's a, it's, it's a project that came with funding that allowed us to be able to do that. On our day-to-day -day work and the um, day-to-day projects that we do, those ones, we just do um, the monitoring forms, the evaluation forms at the end of the program, mm -hmm. and we'll help people to fill the forms so that we get a better understanding of how the engagement have impacted them as much as we can. You have to understand that if it's a marketplace, we are not doing that because I don't know who we are giving the forms to. Right. But we, in engaging people, you know, we ask them what else would they like to see us do? If we have the capacity, we'll do it. Maybe you go on a day, they'll tell you, no, today actually is not a good day. Just come on a market day. You go on a market day, you engage the So after a while, they say, you know, these are the, these are the leaders. These are the vegetable queens. These are the yam kings and queens, whatever. And then you start to engage them. So work in that kind of systematic way, but the actual social science data collection that we can do to mm. say for a fact that okay. this is the direct um, uh, cause of, uh, this is the impact of what we've done. That one, we do it when we have a project that allows us to be able to do that. Okay. We'll have to make some time to sit and talk about your mandate and to get a more detailed today is not the day. understanding of what the NCC does. I thought does. today was the day. Uh, well, <laughs> today is the day for our constitution because we want to learn more about our constitution. Okay. In fact, we want to learn more about the relevance of our constitution, mm. especially coming at a time when there's a talk, the big talk, in fact, as we speak, is whether this constitution we're operating is actually fit for purpose and that we've been, we'll be operating a constitution which was actually meant to serve somebody else's purpose, and, uh, or to serve somebody's whims and caprices, and now 
we are suffering the consequences. And I'm not saying what I'm saying is actually a fact. I know that's what somebody you're else's, saying. Fact, I, I, somebody's I, opinion. I, I understand so, completely. Yeah. So and I would say, let me yeah. let me just say that first of all, okay. I hope that we'll have time yeah. for a discussion beyond constitutional reforms. Because Absolutely. To be honest, it is an issue that has been overflowed. Absolutely. I We've agree. over discussed it. Yes. We've you understand. Yeah. And there's a lot going on. And to say that this constitution was set up for one man, I don't think it's entirely true. I mean, this is a constitution that has, <laughs> that is so, it's, it's amazing in so many ways. Yeah. If you look at the chapter six, you know, directly principles of state policy. policy. If you look at the chapter on, on human rights, if you look at the chapter on the media, look at all these great elements of the constitution. You can't tell me that that constitution, there's no, nothing to it. Right. In any case, we may be in a bit of a difficult time at this very moment. But the 30 years before the Constitution, yeah. we've done much better the 30 years in the last... We've done better in the last 30 years than the 30 years before the Constitution. Okay. So, and I understand that people will look at what they are feeling today and make a judgment based on that. Right. Uh, Constitution is a living document. And when it's time to review, it's, it's perfectly fine. Right. You know, it's a, it's, it should be reviewed as and when it comes out. And for us, 30 years is a pretty long time. Um, Constitution was written in a very different time. Very, that, that, the, the Ghana of 30 years ago was very, very different from the Ghana of today. Of today, absolutely. And for me, it's not even, you know, all these things they say about it was written for one person. Mm. Thing, I don't think it's quite fair to the right. framers who did a lot of detailed work to put this document together. Of course, it has weaknesses. Okay. Who doesn't have weaknesses? Right. Constitution has weaknesses because we have evolved. Things have changed. Right. I mean, there was no conception of social media, for instance, you know, so even how the media laws were framed did not take all of this into consideration. Mm. For me, those are some of the things that we should be, you know, of course, we've come a long way and we have realized that a lot of power was vested in the presidency, right? right? right. And we need to change that. Mm. I think it's fair. It's not, and I don't think that there's any resistance to that as such. Okay. The big thing for me with the constitution is the fact that we are still not electing heads of local government. For me, that's the big thing. Right. You know, because that alone, if we start doing that, it resolves a lot of problems uh, in the governance structure. So for me, it's the one thing that if you ask me, I can boldly say that I'm hoping that we are able, if we are not able to do everything and we can't in one sitting, we should start with ensuring that we are electing the heads of local government. Okay. So they bring some sanity into the governance um, architecture that we see today. Right. You we'll know. come back to that mm -hmm. because, as you do know, there are pros and cons to this proposal. There are those who are for it and there are those against it. Even though I must agree that it appears that the two, um, you know, uh, the two the political two actors agree in yes. principle yes. that yes. the election must yes. take place. Yes. What they do not agree on is whether we should make it partisan or not. And that's, I don't even that's think a, that's a big it's deal. Even, it's even necessary. No, no, no. It's not even necessary because okay. you know that we can always do things in steps. Yeah. The doing it on a non-partisan basis is a low-hanging fruit. We can take that as a step one. Okay. If we do it, and after a while, we see that the partisan... People say that, meanwhile, we are the most partisan people. <laughs> <laughs> do you understand? People will not even go and vote if yeah. their parties are not represented. Yeah. Yet they if you want to call a spade a spade and not a two-for-day. That is the spade yeah. we are calling yeah. a spade right yeah. now. People don't go for the local elections. Why? They don't see their parties. Mm. They don't see their colors. They Absolutely. are not excited. Yeah. You know? Because this is a highly partisan society, society. you know. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is what it is, yeah. you know. So, but if we can't do that now, fine. Mm. Why don't we take the first step, which does not even require a referendum, okay. which can be easily done. Why don't we take that first step and use that opportunity to look at all the other aspects of local government that we, that we need tweaking okay. once we start electing uh, 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 the heads of local government. On a non-partisan, on a party, I don't think it's such a huge thing that we must bring um, our progress to a standstill or a halt because of that. Mm. I think that we can we can come to an arrangement where we take the first step after we, and then we build it. In the next couple of years, we we'll review, we we'll see if this non-partisan basis is working. If it's working, we keep going. If it's not working. I think that's the way. So it's got to be a gradual process. We can make it a gradual process, process. if we want. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah. But we we can make we, it a gradual we the people, the nation, can make it we a can process. decide that we make it a gradual process. Yeah. We can decide yeah. that we do it. It's all us. It's all us. So the whole idea is that we want to deepen the sense of accountability. Right. People must feel that they were given a certain mandate, and if they do not, 
um, you know, if they do not live up to the mandate, mm. there must be some consequences. Is that really a if constitutional we... problem, though? Well, the, the, it, the, the way we are, the way we treat laws in this country, do you think it's a constitutional problem? No, it's more of an attitudinal problem. Exactly. I agree. So, 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 so there are so many laws. There's almost nothing that you, can, you cannot find a proper yeah. law on in yeah. this country. We have issues with enforcement. Mm -hmm. We have issues with people um, not automatically doing the right thing and all of that. We have attitudinal problem. We have mindset problem. Let's focus on those things. Those things. Because if we are, we are still the way we are, I'm telling you, dear Angel Gabriel can come and rewrite this whole constitution for us. And nothing will change. Because we are the way we are. So for me, and you know, when I say it, it sounds a little self-serving, but really, truly, we must focus on building the mindset, right. the attitudes that go with living in a democracy, and the attitude that goes with understanding what citizenship means, knowing your rights, but understanding and you know, committing to your responsibilities, not dodging taxes. You know, not wasting state resources, not being corrupt. These, these things, let's these things. put energy into getting people to have that mindset. Right, the software. And it will, it will serve us much better. Right. Because it's really not about the constitution. If you're going by that constitution, if we were going by it, we'd be living in paradise. Right. All so, of us. So that explains why mm. you don't think that we must place so much emphasis on whether or not this constitution needs to be. It is not. No, that's not to say yeah. you are for against it, but you think that that's not the elephant in the room. Well, the elephant in the room, room really. Be careful is got how to you do... use certain okay. animals in the season that we are in. <laughs> I get that. Please, but that's so. not that's not the big issue. You know, that's not the big issue. The big issue is our mindset, it's which mindset. ought to change. If it doesn't change, like you said, we can have the best constitution, but if the people are not prepared to, you know to observe the constitution the way it is, we'll still be we'll where still, we are. We'll still have problems. Yeah, we'll, yeah. That is not to say the constitution must not change. Oh, I agree with you. There's, it's agree. time for a review. Look, what other discussion do we need to do to get this review going? Mm -hmm. We had all that exercise, that big exercise from 2010. Yeah. Under the, Prof Mills. Under the constitution review committee. All the recommendations are I sitting mean, there. It's a white paper. As we speak, over the last two years, a lot of organizations, a lot of um, collaborations, there's a lot of work, mm -hmm. you know, reviewing the review, reviewing the original, putting together new, new getting inputs from different, different facets of society. A lot of work has been done and a lot of material has been gathered. How do we take the next couple of steps? We okay. can't do all the recommendations, cannot be um, put out for the people to decide at once. Or maybe we've decided that that's what we want to do. Whatever the case is, we need to move on to the next step. Right. I don't like to keep things at this discussion stage because I think we've exhausted it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've exhausted it. So let's, let's see how we do the next set of things. And mm -hmm. that's for me has a lot more value, right. you know. I don't have a lot of time here. I want to talk about No, that's okay. That's, that's fine. <laughs> so I actually want, to, I want to, walk, to walk us through what is it that we would need to change if indeed we want to want no, to move forward. I don't think that this that's, is the right forum for that. That's fine. What we that's need fine. to change, first of all, you have yeah. to understand that it's not for the NCC to say. Right. That's not our role. Right. What we need to change will have to come from the people through the mechanisms that have been set up. Okay. NCC's role is a public education role. Right. Once we know what we need to change, once we know the process, we educate the people so that we are all on board. Okay. So we are all committed to a certain right. course. But our job description really is not, I mean, we do, we consider ourselves the vanguard of the constitution, but you know we don't get to say <laughs> we don't get to say what changes are, are, are necessary or right. useful at any point that's in fine. time. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. So as we celebrate the constitution, what are some of the things that you think that the public must know okay. about, about right. this all, right. all important thing? All right, all right. Um, just just for people to understand that, um, you know, people say that democracy is not delivering, it's hard, and mm. all of that. But first of all, democracy works in a particular way. It does not promise ease. There's no way that you find where it is written that democracy will be easy. Democracy requires that everybody works very hard to make it work. Sure. And then it works for the benefit of everybody, right? I think that sometimes we, we get caught up in a, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a certain orientation where it's almost like we, all, we always know what somebody else didn't do right for somebody. But I feel we also have to turn, turn the, the, the focus on ourselves. So what can we do? What, what is our responsibility as citizens to get 
things going for, for all of us. How, how, for instance, as citizens, what do we need to do to ensure that we are not undermining democracy? Right? And so in our press, in our press that's when I talked about the money, money, money in politics. That is one big way in which, as citizens, we are actively, hmm? brazenly undermining democracy and the Constitution. Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm, we have decided mm -hmm. that we put a financial uh, 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 price on, on votes. Right. right. So things like that is what we should be looking at. Okay. Because I think that a lot of people know, right, not everybody, um, quite a few people, fewer understand yeah. the responsibility. Right. And even fewer understand the arrangement, the, the arrangement that says that we've elected these people, we pay our taxes, we hold them accounts, they deliver the dividends to us, you know. That arrangement, right, that social contract, right, a lot of people don't understand it. We need to let people understand that when, when you elect somebody, right, they are supposed to deliver a set of public goods. It is not their job to put direct money in your pocket. That's not what, that's not what this is about. But, you know, MPs have to have a lot of money, half a million, million dollars. Yeah. Yes, so according to a research done by CDD, Absolutely. they need all this money just to run to for elected, office. Yes. And a bulk of that money goes into direct transfers, money into people's hands. Yep. It's not sustainable, you know. And I know that the original, <laughs> the original um, headline that came out on this set is not attainable. No, that's not the, that's the wrong word. Absolutely wrong. It's, actually it's not sustainable. Not sustainable. Yeah. We cannot run a democracy. We cannot even run a country like that. continue like that. Like that. Yes, even any kind of system you can run by, by putting money in everybody's hand. We have to recognize that and decide that we don't want to do this. When we, when we hold politicians to account using a different set of indicators, they were just. They will, because they are not, they are rational human beings. Right. They started this money business, but now they themselves, that's over them. You call any politician and ask them whether they like the current state of affairs whereby yeah. you have to have this mighty war chest just to get elected to be an MP. It's not easy for it's them. It's tough, it's tough. Where does one find half a million dollars to just play with like that? I don't know. But gamble, really, because it doesn't even guarantee. All you need is one guy who has 50,000 more than you do. We can't run a democracy like that. It's supposed to be a competition of ideas, not a competition of who has more. Because if it's who has more, then what value are they bringing to the actual job, which is the governance, which is working for the people, which is service to the people, which ensures that they open themselves and allow themselves to be held accountable because they've done the right thing. But have you bothered to find out why the, the, the electorate or the voter also demands these monies from yeah. electorate? Elect I think it's a culture that has just evolved. Right. It's a culture, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Farijan even mentioned it in yes, his talk, yes, yes, that yes. In, in, previously we used to just hear rumors about these things. It's not brazen. It's not brazen. Yeah. Previously, it was rumors yeah. and people, we yeah. hear it and we say, no, it can't yeah. be true. You yeah. can't prove it, nothing. Now, the people giving the money are on TV explaining why they are giving and Absolutely. telling you they are doing the right thing. Yeah. The people collecting the money are also on TV saying that, yes, we took this from this person. We took this. And they're happy. We've lost. We've yeah. lost. We've lost Amorals, it. Yeah. We've lost it. I don't even think it's so much. It's working in your own, against your own self-interest. Because people don't understand what it means that when you take money from a politician, if all of us go and take money from a politician, there goes our road in our school and wherever, whatever it is. The public goods that should be delivered for us, there goes. As 5,000 cities in your They hand. will tell you, and yeah. I'm not justifying it mm -hmm. anyway, but we interact with them too. They'll tell you that whether I collect the money or not, the road will not be done. But then if you then don't collect... The public goods will not be delivered. If so you I'm don't... Well collect no, no, no. Me, I know this is what I got in four me, years. Let me tell you something. If you don't collect the money... The accountability uh, uh, engagement is stronger. I can't tell you. They will fear that they will not they will not lose their they will lose their seats if nobody's collecting money. Okay. Imagine one day we get into an election season, the electorate decide that you yeah, can't show you. I won't take your money. No. Imagine how people will shake in their boots. Because how then do you know the criteria that people are using to select? You understand? It is taking the easy way out to say, oh, ask for me, I'll take my money up front. But the point is that. When you take money, holding the person accountable becomes a tricky affair, you know, because you've come to a different arrangement with them. You've elected them based it on... It becomes transactional. 
Yes, you've basically you've done a transaction with I'm your vote. I'm giving you my money, so that's it. Yes. Don't expect anything from yes, me. Yes, exactly. You, I, it is I mean, not, you voted for me. I've paid for it, so that's it. It's not stated, but it is implied. It's implied. Absolutely. It's implied. Yeah. If if you are not taking money from politicians, you can hold them to account. The accountability is stronger. I get it. You understand. Okay. So, and I know they'll say, so should should they stop offering or should we stop, stop, collecting? stop collecting? Because now it's not just a supply side problem, it is a demand side problem as well. There is a clear demand, it is open, it is on TV, the, the threats are out there. So, if you're threatening people that if you don't give us money, we won't vote for you, and then, then, then they do ways and means and bring money to you. Right. And then at the end of the day, you're not getting development. We must take some responsibility. Not all, but some responsibility for the outcome. We must take some responsibility for it. And then we should be able to say, okay, we want to do things differently. We want to stop this. We want to stop. Because you see, the other thing is that the money is dangerous. Because if you reduce it down to money, there will always be somebody with a bigger bag. And also, you don't know where the money is coming from. In this country... But who cares? And, oh, you think you shouldn't care. No, Let me tell you. I don't care where the money is coming from. Let me tell you What's why. He's also a businessman. He has money. I mean, no, he, it's a, he it, runs. first of all, a lot of business. Anyway, let me not go into it. Let me just stay with my script. <laughs> Point is, let me, be careful what people deem to be as business. Thank you. That's the thing. Be careful. You're not going to say then, much. And then yeah. also, there's a lot of bad money floating in the world. We are not insulated from global yeah. dynamics. Yeah. There's drug money in the world. There's human trafficking money. Illicit money. There's illicit money. There's there's illicit mining money. Yeah. All these monies are waiting for investments, okay. opportunities. But isn't all money money? No, it's not. Because these monies must go back. The money is not free. It will go back to where right. it came from with interest. That's the truth. Okay. You see, so we have to decide which way we are trying to go. I and, and, and the thing is that if we reduce it to money, one day anybody, anybody at all can come and say, I'm a messiah, Right? I have all this money, I'm splashing it all around. And all of a sudden, we're like, oh, this is a good guy. You know, he knows what he's doing. Why? Because he's giving you money. We have to, we have to reorient look, look, ourselves. Catherine, I, I, look, I totally agree with you. And mm -hmm. I, I would want to add that there's absolutely no justification why people must collect money from a politician mm -hmm. before they vote for them. Because then, like you said, it becomes a contestation of who has more money. And when it becomes a contestation of who has more money, then the accountability mechanism is also weaker. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, say, we cannot have this conversation without looking at the external factors. The external factors, which is, I come with the amount for. People really and truly, no, that's not, no, no I'm just, no, let, let's have I a more realistic I, conversation. I understand you. People are so hungry, it's mm -hmm. not funny. Mm -hmm. To the point where, at that, at that time, they are not thinking as nationalistic as you are. Because her daughter or her son or her father or her mother or somebody who is very dear to her heart is in some kind of financial distress. So that's what you're thinking about at that time. Okay. My, 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 so my question then comes, which is, in as much as we're asking the citizens or the voters to stop collecting money from, this, mm. from, the, for, from the politicians, don't you also think that the politicians must work extra hard to make sure that the economy is much better so that people... Oh, but that goes without saying. Yeah, so, no, no, no. Let me, because we're talking no, no. about the responsibility no, no, no. of be, the be, be, voter. Be, be, because okay. we, we tend to play that down. I said yeah. it doesn't matter. It yeah. matters. It matters. But of course, I mean, who, who is electing anybody to come and not deliver? That's, that's never the reason why we are elected. Absolutely. Even if we collect money, we expect our public goods. We expect a thriving economy. Yeah. We expect all the things that will help us live a better life, isn't it? So that goes without saying. Okay. That goes without saying. Of course, politicians mm -hmm. must deliver better. You know, must 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 set set things up because that's how we elect them. You know, some it's not everybody who can be a politician. The thing about democracy is that nobody even comes to force you. You come and say that all the people I think that I can deliver these things for you. You know, you have the confidence, you have the ideas, you have you have the support. You can galvanize people. You can, you, can, you can bring your vision to life. You can get people to come along. You have a responsibility. You understand? Yeah. I'm not you must downplaying live up to that. Um, yeah. You must live up to it. Yeah. You know? But I feel that we must find a, uh, the, the accountability mechanism. It's what is missing. And it is missing because of this transactional nature, or that, the, the, the transactional nature of the way people get elected. 
it's part of the reason. I get it. And the person comes and shares money. Now, what, what do you do about the actual things that you need? That's a very good question. What do you, what do you then do with yes. other, the, other actual things, things that you that need? You I think at this juncture, we'd like to take a break. No, just in case you're joined, you're just joined us. We're having a very important conversation about the democracy we're, we're, we're practicing. It's nascent. It's new, actually. It's about, what, 30 years. And it's come at a time when we just finished celebrating Constitution Day on Monday. And we have the NCC boss, the chairperson, who's a very busy woman, but she tries to make time. Um, for the media, because there's very, very, very important things that she needs to talk to Ghanaians about. And Kathleen Adi is, is with us here. We'll take a break. When we come back, she has a lot more to say about why we need to protect the Constitution, why we need to protect this democracy, and some of the things that we need to do right if really we want to enjoy the fruits of this democratic system that we have we've already elected. <laughs> All right, welcome back. This is Good Afternoon Ghana. My name is Audu Moro. Today we're having a conversation about Ghana's democracy, why it's important for us to keep it, to maintain it, and to sustain it. I have the chairperson of the NCCE, Madame Kathleen Adi, who's been with us in the last term, um, 35 minutes or so, talking about the subject matter. Before I bring her in, before I, I, re, also I bring her back in, she has um, been raising alarm regarding the matter of votes buying within the political landscape of the nation. In fact, in an address on Constitution Day, she emphasized that this menace pose a significant threat to the democracy of this country. Let's watch this tape briefly and then we'll come back. With just under a year until the 2024 general election, various stakeholders have begun expressing their concerns regarding the importance of conducting themselves appropriately on 7th December. The National Commission for Civic Education, responsible for actively educating citizens about their rights and responsibilities, is the latest to join this chorus. During a press engagement on Constitution Day, the Commission's chairperson, Kathleen Addy, highlighted her concerns regarding the increasing instance of vote buying and vote inducement within Ghana's political landscape. We are witnesses to the supply of money to voters and the demand for money from voters in the various elections that happened last year. This represents an existential threat to our nation and our well-being as individual Ghanaians. We are at a point where a major criteria for getting elected into public office is the candidate's ability to dole out cash to voters. It is time to own up to this terrible practice and commit to ending it. If we don't end it, it will end us. The chairperson of the commission emphasized the importance of the media refraining from spreading misinformation, hate speech, and provocative statements as the general election approaches. Media houses, especially during the political season, should not allow misinformation, hate speech, personal attacks, highly divisive and provocative utterances, and sometimes extreme vituperation to be broadcast on their channels as this leads to heightened tensions. We forget the power of the media and the example of the Rwanda genocide. Please, Ghana media, wield the power of media for good, for progress, and for elevated development-oriented discourse. She urged the younger generation to refrain from participating in any form of violence. We especially implore young people to absolutely reject any politician that wants to engage them for violence and expose any politician who seeks to entice them with alcohol, drugs, and anything else so that they would do their bidding. The National Commission for Civic Education has urged the government to guarantee the provision of necessary resources in order to fulfill its crucial responsibilities. All right, welcome back. So you just saw her. That's uh, Madame Kathleen Adi uh, telling us more about um, why, it's, it's, why, why it is bad for us to engage in vote buying. And uh, in fact, whilst we're watching this, we're having this conversation off air. She was telling the world, do you know this is illegal? I said, well, it is illegal. So people must be arrested when they engage in vote buying. Um, we've seen the special prosecutor move in on certain persons who were seen in videotapes 
actually giving people money and some people collecting the money. We don't know what this, how far the special prosecutor has gone with that. Yes, she's absolutely right. It is illegal, right? It's illegal. It is, le yeah. is, it is illegal. It, but it doesn't look like a lot of people know it is illegal. No, because we have turned it into, we have, we have tried really hard We've to normalize, normalize it. it. Yes, yeah, normalize yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Appeal DC anyway. law um, 284, yeah. right? If you look yeah. at section, um, section 34, section 33, section 33 talks about bribery. Section 34 is more interesting because it talks about what is called treating. Okay. Let me read an interesting part to you. Okay. A person commits the offense of treating if he corruptly, either himself or through another person, before, during, or after an election, gives or provides or pays wholly or in part the expenses of giving or providing meat, drink, entertainment, or provision to or for any person. For the purpose of corruptly influencing the person or another person to vote or refrain from voting. How do you, how do you determine whether this is meant to corrupt the meat. No, no, no. You see, look at the spirit of the whole thing. Even meat and water is illegal. But it's, it's just to facilitate your daily activity. I mean, of course. Yeah. I, I, it's a conversation. I'm just telling you <laughs> from the, the point of view of the, of the law. Of, yes. Okay, meat right. and water. Yes. I don't know how they came up with those specific <laughs> things, but... So that's a very interesting one. I've never heard anybody actually, yes. you know, bring this matter out. But it's a very interesting one. But vote by is a, is a bad thing. What other thing, Captain, do you think we need to watch out? I okay, mean, if we so, really want to sustain I mean, the, yes. democracy? Uh, no, a lot of these things, the election yeah. season are things we look out for. Okay. But they are new things. Right. One of the new things is uh, religious intolerance. Right. Because, you know, we've lived, we've been a, a, a peaceful society. Quest, yeah. Where we've existence. lived, the religions have existed peacefully. You know, we've never had that problem until you have a, a candidate who is a Muslim, and then suddenly, you know, and we don't want to add religious intolerance yeah. to the basket of issues that we have to deal with every election year, right. which is already too much, considering that 30 years down the line, we shouldn't even be going, election year should not be a high alert year. We should have normalized this thing by now. But now, on top of that, we are adding elements of, you know, I think that, you know, this we have to be careful from, yeah, we, because we can see the effects of that kind of thing in other countries, you know, because the religion, people hold it very dear, people are emotional about it. And once you start doing these things and then you start skewing perceptions and people feel threatened, you're going to have a different set of problems on your hand. The other thing that is normally, normally would not, it's becoming more of an issue as the time, as years go on, is the use of fake news, misinformation, and disinformation. Right now, majority of people are online, our lives are online, people are taking news from live, people are being influenced by what they see. And so, you know, what people see online especially in this is their era, reality. Especially in this era of AI. Yes, you know, we have to it's be careful worse. because, you know, you say something, it's like you're stoking a fire. Somebody reads it, they add something, they share it, and next thing you know, you have a problem that is... The magnitude of a problem goes way beyond what was written, you know. And we know that uh, uh, um, outside of what people would do, what different actors in the political terrain would do, we all know that there are other forces coming from outside that also want to influence things in a particular way. We know how robots are being deployed huh? and, and narratives being shift, sh shaped and shifted from all of these. So we need to have a very clear... Um, understanding of how to consume social media. We must also, as a people, not forward anything, just anything that lands in your box or in your, in your WhatsApp. Don't just forward, especially if the thing looks explosive, you know, if the thing looks like it's incitement, the thing looks like it will create a problem. You should think twice about it. Is this even real? Is this even real? Is it true that this thing has happened in this place? Can I verify? Can I check in one or two other um, platforms to see if this is real? Before we forward, we are spending a lot of money on data just to forward things, create problems for everybody. You know? So, those, and of course, the violence. One of the things I said was that, look, this year, nobody should lose a life. Nobody should lose a limb. And nobody should shed one drop of blood for the sake of politics to get somebody elected. It's not worth it. The so young people must value their lives and their limbs and their blood. We, we are not, this year, we are not wasting any of it for the sake of policy. When they come and they say that here are the guns, here are the knives, advise yourself. that this, If you really want to help me, pay for a course for me to do. 
if you really want to help me, I'm doing this online program. I need to pay for it. Pay for it. Do you understand? If you it. say it's help that you're helping me, right? Rather than, here, take a knife. Here, take a gun. Go and fight. It's going to cause this trouble. That person is not helping you. That person is not supporting you. You know? That person has seen you as a dispensable item. Somebody whose life can be dispensed with for their own ambitions. And it's, it's very dangerous. We must not go down that route. We are especially vulnerable this year because we face a huge external threat because of everything that's happening around us in the sub-region. There are all kinds of forces at play. People are waiting to see a weakness to take advantage of. It's not enough. The countries they've grabbed and taken and destroyed and divided, it's really not enough at all. They're looking for more countries. They are particularly looking for countries that are coastal, that have infrastructure, that have a road from north to south. So they can run guns, they can run human traffic. There's a lot of things at, at, at stake this time around. So we have to be careful not to um, make the stakes so high that we divide ourselves so deeply that we allow others to come in and further cause problems for us. I get it. How do you again, and, and it's fantastic you know, um, red flags that you think we all need to pay attention to in order that we protect this beautiful democracy that we have, but how do you respond to this, um, um, Kathleen? And again, I'll come back to whether this is actually, again, it exposes a lack of appreciation of what you do in terms of your mandate or your mission, mm -hmm. or those who are making those comments mm -hmm. actually are making a valid and a legitimate point. One of this is this. In fact, just, just a few days ago, the, uh, the biggest opposition party mm -hmm. at the NDC held a news conference and was actually walking us through a litany of issues that they believe actually mm -hmm. poses a danger for us going into the 2024 mm -hmm. elections. And they've said that whilst they're talking about it, they're expecting mm -hmm. bodies like the Peace Council, the NCC, mm -hmm. and all the other states and institutions mm -hmm. and civil society organizations mm -hmm. to actually move in and get these issues addressed. Mm -hmm. Now, if these state institutions and CSOs do not get these issues, issues addressed, then they should forget about talking about peace because there is no, there's never going to be peace if there's no justice. And there's not, if there's never going to be peace if people's fundamental human rights are not, are not upheld. And so whilst you're talking about people's rights and things, so whilst you're talking about people's responsibilities, you must also be talking about their rights. Sure. How do you, I'm sure you've heard some of these things from time to time. Yeah, yeah. How does a body like the NCC respond mm -hmm. to some of these um, appeals? Or you mm -hmm. think that this is not one of those things that falls under your mandate, and that is perhaps just the Peace Council, the oh, Christian no, no, Council no. of Ghana, and so I, on. I, I so don't so. think so. First of all, when it, yeah. you have to understand, when it comes to... In fact, no, sorry, there was, there was mentioning about the posture of the Electoral Commission. Right. Because you just talked about a peaceful 2024 yes, election. Yes, yes, yes. There was a talk about the posture of the Electoral yes. Commission. The Electoral Commission now saying that going into the 2024 election, there's not going to be indelible mark, uh, ink, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be the BVDs. Yeah. Um, it's a proposal. It's actually not been something that's not been agreed mm -hmm. upon yet. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also talk about even ending the lecture process at 3 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. the, the, the NDC is saying they're implacably against these two mm -hmm. policy proposals. Mm -hmm. And that they are sending, um, how do you call it, uh, the warning out there for persons who claim to be interested in the unity of uh, the sanctity of the democratic mm -hmm. dispensation that we're practicing. How do you respond to these uh, uh, concerns? No, I can only say that, I mean, all concerns must be taken on board. And that over the years, we have used consensus building through IPAC and other bodies as part of, you know, creating the right um, environment and building the right mechanisms leading towards elections. Right. And I think that those systems are still alive. I don't think that anybody, certainly not the NCC, is intentionally not paying attention to one particular issue or the other. But sometimes you have to understand that there's, an end, there's, there's, a, there's an, a line in terms of the mandate. I don't get to tell the EC how to run an election. I can raise concerns that I feel will uh, um, threaten democracy, will threaten the election, because once the election is threatened, the democracy is threatened. But I don't get to say, you do the election, because I'm not an election. We are not an election management body. So there's a limit to what we can do. And just because we are unable to do that does not mean that we can also not engage others for a peaceful election. I hope, I hope you understand. I it's totally not one understand. or the other. We have to stop, you know, analyzing things in this way. We are building up. Just because there's disagreement today does not mean that we won't resolve it by next week. 
that's also there, you know. So these things, I don't have any kind of response or this or that. All I'm saying is that let's all try to work together. But does it bother you, for instance, right? mm -hmm. the fact that there isn't a healthy relationship between opposition parties and electoral commission? I mean, I'm not going to say it's not new. No, no, it, not, not it only you? is it not, not, not new. It can be resolved, and it will probably be resolved. Is there a role you, you can play? Oh, I'm sure. But the point is, the point I'm making is this. If today the relationship between some institutions is not good, it doesn't mean that it will be the same next week. You understand? So to take today's scenario, when the election day is not tomorrow, right? To take today's scenario and act as if this is a, this, there's nothing can change between today and next week, you know? Let's have some flexibility. Let's all adopt the posture of we give a little, we take a little. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Whoever wins the election must have a country to govern. You win an election and you have, the whole thing is scattered. <laughs> you will be governing from uh, the Republic of Congo or something. Oh, you won't yeah. be here. There will the be Republic no country. Or so you'll be, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be voting. You'll be an MP from the Republic or some other place. And it will only be on paper. We need the country intact at the end of the day. We need everybody's opinion taken into consideration for big decisions to be made. That is how things have been done, and that is part of the reason why, I mean, so much work goes in, into the election season. So much behind the scenes engagements, negotiations, and talking, you know, extending, pulling. That cannot end this time around. We must take everybody's opinion and point of view into consideration in setting up the elections uh, uh, mechanisms moving forward. We can't leave one party or one section highly dissatisfied and then we, it, it will not work. As much as possible, we must pull people together rather than drive them apart. That is, apart from everything else, a personal principle of mine. In our commission, I mean, sometimes we have to say hard things, you know, and we say the hard things, but we don't say it without trying to engage behind the scenes, trying to get people to understand our point, trying to, you know, pull people back from their maybe emotional anger. Sometimes people say things because they are emotionally triggered, you know? So you engage people, you say, that, you say what you need to say as well. So I feel that in these sorts of situations, it's not a matter of saying that this is the right thing and all of that, but to say that we must work towards building consensus. And that, in, that implies that everybody's point of view and everybody's difficulty and everybody's challenge must be taken into consideration before final decisions are made. Like you yourself said, the final decision has not even been made. On this issue, so let's work towards it. You yeah. know, let's work, but as much as possible, we must not let it be what it is to today's situation be, as if this is how it will be for sure before even next month or next week or whatever. Things can change, and you don't know how much work is going on behind the scenes. Right. A lot of things happen outside the view of media. Okay. You know, so, so let's put, so let's let's keep this democracy. Hmm. Um, let's maintain it with all the shortcomings that it has because we don't really have any other option. I think in a nutshell, that's all you're saying. That is what it is. Um, and, and, and let us still have a country to govern after, after a, a election December. Well, well, let's so still have a country to live in. The people let the visit, winners have a country to govern. Actually, the people who visit Rwanda and say, we need a Rwanda type of system, what do you tell them? That's I wish them well. Them. You see, a lot of people say these things. They don't, they don't actually know what it means because they think that all the bad things will happen to somebody else. You know, people call for, oh, let's do this. Because they sit down and think that the bad things will happen to these, the people I don't like. It's not true. The bad things will happen to, if a, if a, if a country collapses, we are all at risk. Yeah, yeah. And we will share the risk equally. Right. If you go for somebody and you think that they can't come for you, they will come for They'll your come people. For okay. You know, so I think that that is very, um, that kind of talk should not be really tolerated at all. It's, it's, it's not so healthy. what are you leaving us with? I mean, so Constitution Day is was celebrated. Constitution on, Day is a was day. Celebrated it's, on we, we, we've, we've commemorated it, but we use that opportunity to raise the issues that will be pertinent for the rest of the year. And this is something you intend to sustain. Oh, absolutely, so. absolutely. We are we are working very hard. We have a plan for the year. We are deploying. Okay. We do the. Our motto is that we'll do the best we can with what we have. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's so that, oh, that is ongoing as well. But we, are definitely, we definitely have a very, a very solid plan okay. for engagement for all sectors of society. Right. We have special plans for young people, okay. um, political party, youth wings, 
um, political party activists, young people in communities, you know, people who have real problems, right? Who have real despair, who feel that they, they have nothing to lose because the, the system is not working for them. We need them to understand that. If you look at the big picture, maybe today is okay. bad, you know, right. but we have hope for Let's tomorrow. Let's hope for, for tomorrow. Yeah. All right. Kathleen Adi, it's the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education. She's been talking to us about the importance of keeping this democracy. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, good afternoon, Ghana. My name is Aldo Moro. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.